All right, so this presentation is on uh, the soldier pile and, and timber lagging. We talked last time about the apparent earth pressure diagrams and how we generate those and how those are used. Now we're going to talk about um, two of the systems that, that we use for uh, excavation support. I, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the sheet pile system because it's really the same. Uh, th there's, not, there's not anything new to talk about that. Uh, different from the way we did sheet piles when we were just doing uh, uh, sheet piles with an anchor. Um, um, and generally speaking, for excavation support, unless it's really shallow, you're not going to be in sh using sheet, wiles, sheet piles anyway because you need the much higher uh, mo modulus that you're going to get out of the other systems, uh, section modulus. So, um, so um, we're going to go back to the sequence for, for uh, installing soldier piles and lagging because that's a very important part of understanding the design. And you, and you need to be able to describe that and describe the different types of lagging that are used and, and how they're installed. There's several different ways to install lagging and that can be important to the performance of the wall. Um, and then um, the, well, the types of lagging and the placement and there's pros and cons to each of those. And then finally, uh, given the right geometry, you should be able to design a soldier pile wall, uh, which means you've got to both uh, specify the excavation sequence, the, the, strut, the struts that you're going to use, and, the, and their section, the whale sections, uh, the H pile spacing, its embedment, and its section modulus, and then the lagging sizes. And we should get to all that stuff today. Uh, so let's go back to the construction sequence. Uh, again, the very first part of this one is to install the piles. We can either drill the piles in others. We can, we can, if, if we're in material that will hold a, uh, a hole open, we can drill the hole and then install the piles. Um, here's a, a picture that we've actually seen before uh, where they're, uh, here's the auger that they just use to drill the pile. And here you can see they're setting an, an H pile in the hole. This is the preferred method. Uh, then you backfill with a weak grout, as you can see here. Um, the other way to do it is to drive the piles. The issue with driving the piles is they're not going to be straight. They might be pretty straight. They might not be very straight at all. Uh, and th and there's some, uh, I've seen some really in interesting pictures of driven piles and brace excavations where the piles actually twist and turn 90 degrees so the high, the, you know, the, so the, the, the high modulus section of the pile is actually in the wrong direction and stuff. So driving can be a problem, but on the other hand, there's places where if you're in cohesionless materials and you can't hold a hole open, you can't drill them anyway. So you can drive them, uh, but if you uh, can afford to uh, and, the, and, the sec and the materials will allow you to, it's much better to uh, drill them. Um, then. Uh, once we've got the piles placed, we're going to excavate and start placing the lagging. And so here's a picture of some lagging placement going on. Notice that they've excavated. When you're using uh, uh, H piles and timber lagging, the, 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 the material that you're in has to have what they call stand-up time or hold-up time. It has to have enough apparent cohesion or true cohesion that you can excavate uh, around the, b below the last level of, of um, um, lagging and install the lagging behind it. Uh, sometimes they actually install behind the lagging um, some straw or other materials to, to, to help prevent erosion and, and press up against the, the uh, soil material. Um, but notice here they've, they've excavated a good six feet below uh, the last set of lagging before they actually go to place the lagging. So you have to have stand up time. And just, here's just another picture, and you can see there's quite a bit of distance here that uh, is open above the, uh, the lagging. And then, once you've got the lagging installed, you install the support. This, uh, this sequence can actually be, the, the detail is that some, sometimes you'll install the support and then excavate down and put the lagging, but your, the details of when each one of those occurs will depend on your design. So, lagging types. Well, there's basically two types of lagging. There's timber lagging, which is by far the most common lagging type. Um, by far the most common. Uh, and then there is concrete lagging. Uh, you will see concrete lagging. Concrete lagging is almost exclusively used in places where you're going to have a permanent H pile wall installed. If you ride the Metrolink lines here along the the uh, the San Bern is it Riverside San Bernardino the San Bernardino line, I think that's the right one. The southern one, is that the San Bernardino line or the Riverside line? 
Um, right here through Pomona, there's a, there's a fairly short H-pile wall. The, 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 the um, um, vertical, the, the exposed vertical part of it is probably only six to eight feet high, but it has um, um, concrete uh, lagging in it. Um, and you see concrete lagging more in Europe because they like to make things out of concrete in Europe. Uh, but for temporary excavation support, it's almost always timber. The, 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 issue, the other issue about the concrete is it's very hard to adjust the length of the concrete. So if you're doing concrete lagging, you have to have really good placement of your piles. And I'd say really good. Doesn't have, there's, there's a lot of room in the flange. There's probably you know, four, four or more inches in the flange to, to adjust it. So you've got quite a bit of room, but you can't just get out the uh, chainsaw and hack off a piece of the wood or, or cut a piece a little longer to put it in there. So you have to have better control over your uh, dimensions. Um, so this is pretty much, the, the, the concrete is pretty much for a permanent uh, for a permanent wall. Steel sheeting, sheeting is used some. I have seen uh, steel sheeting used uh, in fairly small areas. The steel actually doesn't have a very good bending capacity compared to the wood, so it doesn't have that advantage. It, it is, um, um, it's better at controlling water, um, but it's also really expensive. But, but you will see some steel sheeting used occasionally. It's not very common. Uh, it's heavy, it's expensive, and it doesn't really perform uh, any better than the other materials. Um, it is possible to shotcrete, uh, uh, put some wire mesh up there and shotcrete. Uh, that again is a little less common uh, and would usually be used in a case where that, um, well I'm not sure, it's, I was going to say where it's a permanent wall, it may, that may or may not be the case. I think this has sort of been, been replaced by basically using soil nail walls now. Uh, if you're going to put up H piles in and put in shotcrete, and, and if, you, if you're in a material where that works, it's probably material where you could use a soil nail wall too. That one I have heard of but not seen. Um, and then the location. There's three places we can put the lagging. We can put it behind the front flange, which is generally, I, I would say, the most common. At least it used to be the most common, and that's what's going on right here. Notice that the excavation here, if you look carefully, is just in, it just uh, uh, four or six inches behind uh, the front flange. And so the timber is actually going behind the two flanges. And you, you can see a bunch of little tabs on here. Can you see those little tabs on there? They're basically nails that are nailed in and bent over to hold the lagging in. So it's actually placed behind the front flange. That's, the, that's a very, very common one. It can also be placed in front of the front, in, in, on the face of the front flange, but then you need some kind of a clip or something to hold it on. And that's the way this wall is designed. I guess I need to erase that. Uh, but if you look at this, you can see there's these clips that are actually welded on to the face of the, of the flange, and the, and the lagging is going right up against the face of the flange. The advantage of that is you just excavate, excavate straight to the face of the flange. It's a little easier to excavate, particularly with excavation equipment. And it can, and it, there are, depending on how you put the clips on there, it can be a little faster to install the lagging. I've actually seen ones where there's a plate, uh, there's, there's a plate, uh, a bolt here and a plate that goes across and actually they, 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 flan they, they lag up two sections at the same time. There's a, basically a plate that they put on there and there's a little stud welded onto there and they bolt it right on. So that's another method. And the third method which is, um, so th this is contrasting the, um, oh no, this, this is, this is the, another on the face method. If you can see this, can you see this little tube here that's welded? And then this plate, this face plate is in front of the flange and the flange is actually back here. So they, they, that, that way you can excavate straight to the front of the flange and then, then they put this other thing on the front of the flange. Uh, and then the other one is behind the flange. This is about the only place you see that. Lots of times when you're near the surface, you might have a little bit of fill, or you might have uh, you might have a little bit of fill at the surface that you're going to that you're going to fill in. Maybe like in that case, three or four feet. Or sometimes you can excavate back. Uh, um, you might be excavating back a, um, a a steep slope for just a few feet, and it's convenient then just to put it behind a back flange and then backfill behind it. But that's not very common, um, except in that situation you see right there, and then it is actually pretty common. Um, but the, the primary methods for the, the main part of the excavation are either behind or in front of the flange. And the details of that, 
this is a construction detail. I mean, this isn't anything that, the, in, that generally not anything the engineer uh, specifies. But there are some um, differences in how, when, when you're dealing with soils that have less stand-up time, sometimes it's easier to put on the front. The other thing you do when you put it on the front is you can actually kind of under-excavate the soil so that when you actually put it in the system, the, 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 uh, the lagging actually pushes back on the material and it tends to help, it tends to reduce the amount of raveling and, and movement you have into the, into the excavation because you're actually pressing against it. When you, have, when you have this method here where you're putting it behind the front flange, you actually have to jimmy that piece of wood in. You've got to excavate behind there and kind of put it in there and slide it down. So there's got to be some space behind it to put it in there and slide it down and slide it around. So in that case, it's usually not right up against, it's not as tight against the soil as it is uh, when, you put it, when you put it on the front flange. And I haven't, I haven't talked to constructors to know the details about what they like or don't like about that. Do you, do you, do you know Travis at all? Right. That's by far the most common. Yeah. yeah. The, because you, there's, a, there's, a fair amount of, there's a fair amount of time and work that needs to go into developing these clip systems. And I'm not sure they speed up the placement of the, of the lagging much. So my supposition is that they're used when people are very concerned about having to have a really tight fit of the, of the lagging against the soil. Um, and, and, they, and that way they can, they, they, as I say, they, they can basically under-excavate the soil so it sticks maybe a half an inch or an inch out in front of the flange. And then when they jam that thing in there, um, the, when, they, when they jam the, the timber in there, that's actually sort of like pre-stressing it, if you want to think of that, pushing it against the material to reduce um, movement into the, into the excavation. But I've definitely seen a lot of it in photographs, I should say. So it might be an East Coast thing or it might be a European thing. I haven't checked it out well enough to know. OK, so uh, the process is uh, we've got to calculate the strut loads. And again, we have to do this for each stage of construction. Right? So uh, you start off with a preliminary design. You might actually just look at the entire, that you might look at the final excavation and figure out where you think you need to put struts so that you have reasonable loads in the struts. But then you need to go back and do the excavation sequence, just like we talked about at the end of last, uh, last term. So you take a preliminary design. You're going to determine the, the, the geometry of the excavation, uh, estimate the strut locations, and, the, and, uh, and you need to um, assume a pile spacing because you're, it, it's not really feasible to put the struts in between. A, well, you, you can put the struts in between the piles, but if you put the struts in between the piles, you're, you're putting a big moment on your whales that you don't really want to be there. You're still going to have to put whales in because you're not going to put a strut, generally you're not going to put a strut on every pile because the piles are, you know, five feet apart, something like that. You don't want to be putting struts on every pile. Um, so generally you want to put your struts on the piles because uh, that prevents you, that lowers the moments that are in your whalers. Um, so you got to know this, the pile spacing. Um, so then you're going to do the first stage of your excavation. Um, in this stage, the wall's cantilevered, right? And you can use the free earth method to calculate the, the loads and displacement, uh, the, I'm sorry, the loads on the walls. You shouldn't have any problem with embedment on this one because it's going to be really, really deep. Um, um, I mean, theoretically, you've got to compute the minimum, uh, the, the minimum penetration. But for the first one, you're generally going to have, you, you're, it, it's, it's unlikely that you would run into that minimum penetration because the, the penetration that's going to be required is because of the, because of the depth you're going to have to go. Uh, then you're going to check the moments in your H piles, uh, determine your strut loads, uh, and then you go to the stage two of the excavation. Uh, and now we're going to be using an apparent earth pressure diagram for our earth pressures because um, we're going to have that strut load in there, and we won't, we won't have a classic earth pressure. So we put in the, the apparent earth pressure. Notice that the, the, uh, the apparent earth, the, this, the loads on this strut now, we talked about this last time, but it bears repeating. The loads in the strut are going to be the tributary area, assuming uh, that you, you generally assume that where the, the base of the excavation at this point is is a rigid point, although that's not really true. And you're going to take your tributary area. so. Uh, it, a is equal to A here, so it's halfway between, the tributary area is halfway between the base of the excavation and the strut, so this is going to be the tributary load for that strut. 
uh, and then check the strut load because it's not going to be the same as it was before. It's going to be higher than it was before, right? And then you put your new strut in. Uh, um, actually, you need to check the, I should have put this in, and you, you, you need to check the moment in your pile before you put your new strut in because you got the, your highest moment in your pile at this point is going to be right before you put that second strut in, right? So make sure you you got to check every um, sequence, every construction sequence. You got to check it every construction sequence. You can't wish those struts in. You got to excavate. It's going to take time. You got to put all the you're going to put all the lagging up. And then you're going to put the strut in. Uh, so uh, check your moments. Determine the strut loads. You go on to the next stage. You're going to put you're going to have a new earth pressure diagram. Your earth pressure diagram is not going to be the same. So you put your earth pressure diagram in, determine the strut loads, and now you need to check the penetration depth to make sure you have enough penetration for the whole excavation. And then finally check your moments again and make sure you're okay. Uh, once you've got that done, um, I forget if I cover the whaling design. You still have to go to design your whales now. No, no, all we did now is determine struts. Now you've got to go design your whales. And I'm, I don't know if I cover this later or not, but don't forget you know, remember in this direction, um, into the board, if, if this is a, a plan view and this is where your struts are coming in, you've got your you got your H piles in here, and you're putting a strut in every fourth pile. You're going to have to have a beam in this direction to transfer the loads from strut to strut and to the and to the uh, H piles in between. That's your whale or whaler. So you have to design that. Generally, just design that as a continuous, uh, a continuous beam with point loads on it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, OK, now our lagging. How do we do lagging? Um, well, theoretically, the load, you, might, you might think that the loading on the lagging is uniform, but it isn't. Uh, the actual loading on the on the lagging is going to be concentrated actually at the, the H piles because they're going to be for, for two reasons. The H piles are going to be stiffer than the timber. The timber is going to bend a lot more than the H piles are going to move. Also, you're going to be relieving stresses between the H piles when you open up the ground before you put your lagging in. So you're actually uh, so this is actually good news as far as designing the lagging is because it's going to have a lower moment than you would get assuming you had a uniform load because your loads are actually going to concentrate near the supports. So the load looks something like that. We just empirically design these things. Um, you can uh, do, I have heard uh, from designers that they've had to go to agencies and justify the, the, uh, the, the selection of the timber. I really think that's, I think in practice that's seldom done. Um, but if you have to, you can put in a beam, put a simply supported beam in there. Uh, and and if, you, if you get stuck doing that, you should try and justify some kind of low, some some kind of arching to the to the H piles because otherwise you're going to get a much thic thicker section of the of the wood than you need to um, you really need. So it's pretty typical to assume that the distribution is 50 to 80 percent of the theoretical. We don't really design for for this uh, non-uniform load. We just design for a uniform load that's 50 to 80 percent of what you would theoretically calculate. Do you know if Skanska has a particular design method for this? Okay. What I honestly think most people do is they, you know, they they either got their own rules of thumb that they get from, you know, but you don't you don't buy timber in you know half inch increments of this size. You know, it comes in four inch, six inch. So it's not like you got a whole bunch of different choices anyway. Um, but there's some nice guidelines uh, from um, um, in in your FHWA manual for uh, choosing, uh, and it is a function, uh, um, well, th these are the these are for design, I'm sorry, I got lost track of myself. If you're going to design it, they give you both the, the allowable flexural stress and the modulus of the, of the lagging. So theoretically, you could calculate, uh, not only can you calculate the, the rupture and make sure your design so it doesn't break, but theoretically, you can calculate the deflection. I'm not sure that deflection, that calculation is very useful because it's going to be dependent on some load that's not really there in the load. And even if it does start to flex, and that's going to just have an even more load being shed to the H piles. So I'm not sure I would depend on the flexural calculation to mean much of anything. Um, 
But the most common way to do this uh, is, to, is to size this up based on experience. Um, this table in uh, FHWA gives you a guideline. This is that table. And it basically tells you, um, gives you recommended thicknesses of lagging, of rough, rough cut lagging, based on their spacing. Right, this is the spacing. Here's the thicknesses. Um, and based on the, the soil, um, the type of soil and the potential for problems. So I honestly believe this is the most common and probably even the most appropriate way to design lagging. I think there's so many uncertainties with, um, with doing this analysis. I think you're just fooling yourself that you're getting a more accurate analysis than just going to the, the heuristic rules that we've developed over decades and decades of doing this stuff. Um, but I have heard of people who have had to do this to satisfy uh, some regulators. So if you have to, that's how you do it. And I definitely start down here at, by factoring this thing down. And if they really argued with you to the point where you couldn't do that, then maybe you just have to design it for the full load. Um, so uh, monitoring that we need to do uh, during installation. Uh, excavation support is probably one of the places where monitoring is the most important because our entire design was based on a specific construction sequence. Right? We assumed the construction sequence uh, to determine the loads and the struts. And if that's not the construction sequence that's being followed, you're going to have problems. And there's going to be lots of incentive for the contractor to not follow the procedures that you specified. For instance, contractors really love to put in two levels of excavation support at the same time rather than doing one, excavating, doing one, and excavating, doing one. Because it saves a lot of time. Um, and so maybe as a designer, one of the first things you ought to do is check that and see if it works. If it works, fine, let them do it. Uh, but generally speaking, that doesn't work. Okay, so the support needs to be placed the way you designed it. That means both at the locations you designed it and the and the construction sequence that you designed it. Uh, it's got to be it's got to be correct. Um, uh, oftentimes you'll you'll find that the contractors want to over excavate because it's easier to place the the strut when they're actually five feet off the ground instead of two in, you know instead of six inches off the ground. Uh, so there may be incentive to over excavate, or may be over excavate because they're running some equipment and they got it for another week, and if they, you know, if they don't get it excavated today, they're going to have to pay another week's rent. Yeah, you know, I mean, you don't know what the story is, but they'll, there's often times where they're in, they they have incentivized to over excavate. And if you've designed a strut based on what you think the the tributary area is, and they over excavate by five feet, you've now put a much bigger load on that strut than than you designed for. Um, the it's very easy to over excavate for the lagging. The problem here is generally it doesn't this, uh, unless you have soils that have poor stand up time, the problem here generally isn't a problem with the structurally for the wall, but the problem is increased displacements because you're just making a lot more room. You know, you're basically putting a void behind your lagging and you're putting a lot more room for the, for the material to, to, to move into the excavation. And we already determined. The, vol the, amount of the volume of settlement, the volume of the settlement trough is going to be equal to the volume that moves into the excavation, right? We already saw that. So if you over-excavate, it might not seem like much. You over-excavate by two inches all the way down. Well, calculate that volume. And then figure out how much settlement that's going to be, because that, that will be settlement at the surface. Um, sometimes this takes hand excavation to do the lagging right, the lagging excavation right, and people really don't like that. Um, and then if you have soils that have poor stand-up time, if you've got sandy soils, you really need to watch for raveling. And if they're not getting it done fast enough to prevent raveling, then, then, the, then the, you need to stop the job and come up with a, another solution, because that's a good way to lose an excavation. Um, you should be measuring the strut loads. It's not uncommon to get strut loads noticeably different than, than what you designed for. But you, that, so it's really important that you measure them at the, the gold line extension. They had strut loads way higher than they, they designed for, and they might have been 100% higher than they designed them for. Uh, so they were got, they were pretty tight. They were a little concerned for a while. Um, but the worst thing to do is have strut loads 100% higher designed for and not even know it. So if you know it, then you can do something about it. Uh, if you don't know it, uh, you could have a big problem. So you should be measuring the strut loads. 
uh, and you should measure the wall displacements. There are several ways to measure the wall displacements. You can actually just put a um, in slope in a kilometer in the flange uh, of the of a number of the struts, and you can run the slope in kilometer up and down. Uh, you should put survey. You should have more than one way to do this, by the way. Uh, uh, you can put survey monuments and uh, monuments on and do surveying. And now today's with the with the laser systems we have, you can. If you've got the if you've got good control, you can do this with laser scanning. You can actually set up a laser scanner just in, in one place near or at the top of the excavation. You can actually measure a whole bunch of stuff. You do need to be concerned about getting control. You've got to have some control points that that, that you can get um, baselines from for your la for your laser survey. But but there's uh, using lasers uh, now is a um, really viable technique for doing this. It's this is excavation support is a good place to be. Um, um, employing, uh, I just forgot the term for it. Um, it's a good place to be designing, assuming you know what's going on, measuring, if, if, if what you're measuring does not correspond to what you designed for, to making adjustments. Uh, because there's, there's a lot of uncertainties in this. So measurements are a good thing. And then outside your excavation, you need to have survey, uh, survey, uh, survey points for settlement because you will have, even it, if your excavation never moved and there were no displacements, which isn't going to happen, you're still, somebody's still going to sue you for damaging their structure. Um, I know that because one of the, my most lucrative uh, jobs before I started teaching was doing this last bullet, which is going to do pre-construction surveys of the nearby facilities. Um, and that, that's a real interesting business because there's actually three different people that you can be working for. There's three different potential clients who are interested in that data, and sometimes it happens three different times because they're all concerned about conflict of interest. So the one person you can be doing this pre-construction survey for, for the, the adjacent facilities is the owner of that facility. Because if there's any damage, they want to know about it, and they want to know about it early, and they want to have good documentation so they can go take action against the owner and or contractor. The second person you can, you can be working for is the owner of the new facility who doesn't want the person in the other facility to make false claims. And so they want to go out and pre-survey those facilities to make sure that everything is already documented. So when the guy comes in and says, hey, man, I got these cracks all over my apartment building, and say, hey, we surveyed this beforehand. Those were there already. And then the third person you can work for is the construction contractor who wants to know what's going on and be sure that if there's any damage going on, he needs to know whether it's, a, especially if it was a design, bid, build kind of one, because somebody else might have designed the, the support system and they're just building it. And then if there's a deficiency in the design, they want to lay that on the design or not on them. So this was actually a really lucrative business because you got three chances to, to win the, or two or three chances to win the work. Um, so it's the same, but it's, it's interesting, same work, but for different clients, you do it differently. Um, that, but it's really important if you're in a place where they have uh, significant materials, uh, significant structures and things outside, it is essential that you do pre-construction surveys of those uh, of that stuff. Sidewalks, vertical buildings, you, if there's utilities, uh, they often, they'll often run cameras down. Uh, if, they, if there's large utilities, uh, they'll run cameras down the utilities to document the condition beforehand because in many cases nobody's looked at them for 30 decades and they may be all crapped up already. So this is really, really important. And it's uh, more revenue for you. So I, I actually ran the, the, when I, the company I worked for did a lot of uh, design of excavation support and some monitoring of it and, and monitoring of tiebacks and all this stuff. And, and uh, I wasn't actually working for that part of the firm, but my part of the firm, we did lots of uh, building surveys for lots of other reasons, but we actually did this work for the firm. So it was, and, I, and they generated a lot of work for me, and it's, it's just more, more revenue for the company. So it's actually pretty, it, it's good for you. It's good risk management for your company, and it's more revenue for your company. It's a different skill set than, than most of your engineers and your geotechs have, so you've got to get the right people doing this, particularly if you're walking into people's apartments and documenting the conditions of people's apartments while they're occupied and stuff. It, you see a lot of things you wish you'd really never known about. So... Um, and then critical facilities, uh, you know, at, at the um, the new um, I want to say Wyndham. That's not right. What's the new hotel? The, the down in LA they just tore down and built um, Wilshire Grand. The new Wilshire Grand. They're 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 right next to the is that the red line or the purple line that runs down Flower? 
they're very close to the, to, the, to the subway there. So they've got extensometers in the subway, and they've got laser surveys going on subway during construction and during excavation. Uh, and, and, and monitoring those things in real time. These days you can monitor stuff in real time and look at it you know, you know, while you're out to dinner on your cell phone. Uh, so it, and, and there are pe people that specialize in that. So if you're, doing, if you're doing this kind of stuff near critical facilities like that, you should be doing this and you make sure that cost of doing that is in, is in it. You can usually go to the owner and convince them they should do it. In some cases the owner's telling you that they have to do it. Or sometimes the owner of the, in this case the owner of the subway says you gotta do that or they won't let you do, won't let you do the excavation. So, and again, that's just more revenue for the firm, and it's fun and exciting stuff. You end up having to hire some geomatics kind of guys to do that work for you. Shoot, shoot. That's it. Questions about uh, timber H pile and timber lagging? Yeah. When you're designing, when you're determining how deep you can go in the first layer. Yeah, or So you're. Um, I, let me see. Are you talking about to, to excavate for the emplacement of the lagging or for the, the first one before you put the strut in? Oh, it's, it's completely dependent on the soil. Yeah, it's, that, that's, uh, that's completely heuristic based on the kind of soil you got. You can do, if you have cohesion, you know the entire cohesion, you can do the, the uh, 4C divided by, what's the, you can, you, 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 can, you can do a quick calculation. This is a good way to do it, do a quick calculation of the theoretical unsupported height that you can do for an open cut. And, you know, and theoretically, you should be able to support that much. If it's stiff clay, you could probably support if it's, if there's If it's soft, you may not be able to support that much just because of the surcharge load on it. But the big problems generally aren't with clays, because even almost any, if it's a soft clay, you're not going to be using an H-pile wall because you won't be able to, it'll squeeze and you won't have a problem. If it's a medium of stiff clay, it probably has enough stand-up time for the height that you, you, you generally don't do it a whole lot more than six or eight feet because it, you generally it's manual labor that you got to do that. You don't want to set. There's not much point in setting up scaffolding, you know. So, so it's just, does that sound right? Do you, have you seen you guys? Do you have any um, guidelines on heights of those that you do? We never go beyond the OSHA fall hazard, which is five feet. There, there's, there's one I didn't even think about. Yes, because it's just beyond the OSHA fall hazard. Now you got all this other stuff you got to do. So there's a good. So I, I would say generally anything that's got a significant amount of cohesion that's not so soft that it's going to squeeze, you can get five feet of, of stand-up time. The issue is for like silty sands, and and if they're really loose, maybe this isn't the system you want to be using. So if it's soft or really loose, that this is not a good system. Okay. Any other questions? All right, let's just go straight into um, the next one after I remember to save this. Hang on.